All right, uh, welcome to the second session today. Uh, our next speaker is a real treat for us. Phil Harrington has spoken to the Northern Virginia Club on several occasions, and he's spoken at some of our past uh, almost seven star parties. Uh, Phil is a contributing editor for Astronomy Magazine. He's published more than 200 articles since uh, 1988. Uh, he frequently reviews telescopes, binoculars, and other astronomical equipment. He also writes uh, their monthly column, uh, Binocular uh, Universe. He authors a monthly article on uh, cloudy nights called Cosmic Challenge. And that was a title of your last book also, wasn't it? Cosmic Challenge, which is a great book, by the way. And, uh, and I will say, I don't know how many of these touring the University of Binocular books I've helped you sell, Phil, but I, I, I take it everywhere. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Uh, he is, for, for several years, well, Phil and I first met in 1991 at Stellafane, and this year was Phil's 50th time to go to Stellafane. And I have the shirt to prove it. Oh, where, man. Right here. Some, some, a, a, a girl up in, New, in um, Massachusetts uh, made um, uh, shirts for myself. Our 50th convention. So I'm proudly wearing mine today. And so I guess there, there was a total of three people that have made, reached that milestone, right? Yep, that, uh, at least this year. Incredible yeah, experience. Yeah. Uh, I do want to mention, uh, I gosh, I, I read Phil's articles for years uh, before I actually met him. Uh, he was awarded the uh, 2018 Walter Scott Houston uh, Award. Uh, he's an adjunct professor at Suffolk County Community College, where he teaches courses in uh, stellar and planetary astronomy. He's a founding member of the Westport uh, Astronomical Society. And uh, Phil, I know they want to hear you a lot more than they want to hear me <laughs> tell them what a great guy you are. So I'm going to shut up and turn it over to you, Phil. So. Well, we'll we'll see if they're saying the same thing an hour from now. But um, <laughs> very good, thank you. And and to to credit the shirt real quickly, uh, uh, Caitlin uh, Gillette, 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 Gillette. I'm probably mispronouncing that name. She's the one who created it, and it really just caught all three of us off guard because uh, I get we uh, we gave presentations. Friday afternoon at Cellophane, all of a sudden she did this presentation uh, to us before the, the first talk began. I was just blown over by it. So anyway, uh, well, thank you for having me, having me back, uh, Dan and company. Really do appreciate it. Wish I was with you in person at the uh, the star party, but uh, the be next best thing is to do it uh, virtually. And so that's where we are now. Uh, Dan, over the last couple of years, has asked me to put together a um, list of binocular objects that people can hunt for uh, during the convention. And that's actually a, a follow-on to a, uh, something I've been doing similar for Stellafane in the last few years. It's called the Binocular Observing Olympics up there. Well, here we're calling it the Binocular Observing Challenge. And so what I'd like to do this afternoon is to go over, well, the 20 objects that consist uh, this year's the 2022 uh, Observing Challenge. But at the same time, talk a little bit about binocular basics, just a, a quick intro to some of it, because I, I want you to try to get the most you can out of your binoculars. You're going to find that some of the objects on my, my list are challenging. Uh, some of you will say that they're, they're right and possible. Uh, but I will tell you, I've seen them all. So uh, they, are, they are indeed possible. They take a little hunting around for maybe. Uh, but that's the idea of it. It's a challenge. It's not meant to be uh, simple <laughs> necessarily. And I would really be interested after you attempt my list to go um, at the very end of the very bottom of the list, I should say, is my contact information. I'd like to know how you did. I'd be very interested in recommendations for future objects, things like that, because hopefully with the group's blessing here, there'll be a 2023 version of this uh, list coming along next year. So I'd like to know your thoughts, both good and bad, about some of the objects I chose. And, you know, do you hate me for this object or... Did you realize you never could see that in binoculars, but there it was, things like that, okay? So anyway, uh, having said all that then, uh, let's start with some basics, if we could. Binoculars, as I'm sure you're aware, are typically available in fairly standard combinations of numbers uh, with an X in the middle of a 7 by 35, 7 by 50, 10 by 50, and so on. Uh, the first number we have preceding the X is magnification, and the number following the uh, X is the, the aperture expressed in millimeters. So 7 by 35 binoculars, 7 power. It'll magnitude, magnify objects seven times what they appear to the eye alone. And the front objective lenses are each 35 millimeters, or a little better than an inch, uh, in diameter. 
And we have 7 by 50, 10 by 50s. These are fairly standard combinations. There are some others certainly intermixed here also, but they're fairly standard combinations. And you're never going to see, for instance, a binocular that will magnify 50 times with 10 millimeter objective lenses. So in other words, you'll never see a 50 by 10. It's always 10 by 50 and so forth. And that's because this combination yields or produces the diameter of the field that's entering your eye and your eye then focuses it, and you, your brain perceives the image that you're, you're aiming at right now. Um, this field that I'm referring to, oh, I should say before, um, some people are under the impression that bigger is better. If you go back to the previous, let me just backtrack one second, please. You'll notice that we have 10, we have 16 power, sometimes 11 power, 20, 25, and, and so on. A lot of people are under the false impression that bigger is better. In other words, if I have, let's say, 7 by 35 binoculars or maybe let's say 10 by 50 binoculars well gee 10 by 50 must be good but if i go larger both in terms of magnification as well as maybe the the aperture of the objective lenses it's got to be a better binocular and that simply is is not the case it's not the case because you have to really judge before you can say that this is the binocular for me you really have to judge your circumstances because the best binocular for me may be totally different than the best binocular for you it depends on you. It also depends on where you're going to be viewing the, the uh, sky with those binoculars. It also depends on how you're going to be holding them and all kinds of other parameters. And it, it really is a very individualized choice. I get letters from readers of my column in astronomy all the time asking me, what's the best binocular for me? And I'm sure they're very disappointed when they get the email from me saying, I don't know, because I don't know. But I do ask them some questions. Where do you live? Um, are you how are you supporting those binoculars by hand or a tripod or some other mechanism? Things like that. What are you interested in viewing? So all kinds of different questions. And you have to get those answers to those questions in clear in your mind before you say, okay, this is the binocular for me. So just real quickly, some uh, tips and tricks before we start to look at the objects in this year's uh, binocular challenge. First off, the numbers. Okay, the numbers, 7 by 35, 10 by 50, 11 by 80, and so forth, okay? Really, those standard combinations are created because it's the two numbers as they work together that will dictate the diameter of the, the so-called exit pupil. That's the, the light leaving the eyepiece of the binocular and entering your eye's pupil. So the exit pupil from the binoculars goes into your eye's entrance pupil. Okay. And you want to know what the diameter of that exit pupil is, because if it's too large or if it's too small, then the binoculars aren't going to perform as, as well as they might. Well, of course, then you have to know what's the entrance pupil of your eye. In other words, your eye's pupil, what is it dilated to? Now, the human eye typically will constrict down in very bright light conditions, say a, a bright beach or maybe a, a sunlit uh, field of snow will contract down to eh, roughly two or three millimeters in diameters. It will expand or dilate upwards to seven. And that's pretty much the max, seven millimeters in, in diameter. But it takes extraordinary conditions for your eyes to dilate to a full seven millimeters. And as a matter of fact, right now at my, my age of 66, my eyes don't come anywhere near seven millimeters when they're fully dilated. Even if I go to the uh, ophthalmologist and they dilate to do an annual eye, eye exam, my eyes aren't going to expand, the pupils that is not going to expand to seven millimeters. It just, it's an age thing among others. So you have to ask yourself that question. See, here's what you, what you don't want. You don't want on the left-hand side, you don't, I'm sorry, you do want what's on the left-hand side, I apologize. Under very dark sky conditions and assuming young eyes, I'm going to find what young is on the next slide. Notice that the exit pupil leaving the cone of light, leaving the eyepiece, going into the observer's eye. Notice the observer's eye is fully dilated. And so the diameter of the exit pupil matches the diameter of the observer's entrance pupil. And that's a good thing. But on the right-hand side, well, now you'll notice that the observer's eye is not fully dilated or at least it's not dilated to match the exit pupil. Instead, it's smaller. Could be because of, of light polluted conditions. Could be because of older eyes. Could be both of the above. And so you have to pick a pair of binoculars, ideally at least, 
where you know the exit pupil is going to pretty much match your eye's entrance pupil under the typical condition, conditions that you're going to be using those binoculars under. Well, how do you know? Well, I, and again, as I mentioned, age has something to do with it, certainly, even under perfect textbook, perfectly dark conditions. Okay. Take a look at this, this um, graph, okay, which comes from Aging and Dark Adaptation, published back in November of 1999, but I can bet the day is pretty close to still the same today. Vertically, the uh, the y-axis, we have fully dilated pupil diameter expressed in millimeters from zero all the way up to eight millimeters. And then horizontally, the x-axis, we have ages from zero, uh, 20, 40, 16, 80 years of age. Okay, So let's try to plot some of the data points. And you're going to see this. You're going to see that right around the age of, you know, the mid-teens or so, that's when your eyes are pretty much at their peak in terms of, of pupil dilation okay pretty much at their peak that's when your eye is going to dilate to seven maybe even a little bit better than seven millimeters when fully dilated either again chemically because you're at a, uh, the eye doctor's office or under a very dark sky perfectly dark sky but then look what happens as you age even again under those perfect conditions take a look at the graph by the time you hit the age of 20 or let's say 30 over here, now under perfect conditions, it's not seven millimeters anymore. Go a little bit farther to 40, now it's about six and a half or thereabouts. By the time you hit 50, AARP is knocking at your door. Now you're about six millimeters. You keep on dropping and okay, here I'm at about, you know, I'm, I'm about here right now at 66. So I'm looking at a little better than five. Okay, and then you, you drop off even further still as you, as you go. And then it pretty much flattens out beyond, beyond the age of 80. Um, so therefore, this is me talking now at my age. Therefore, even under perfect conditions, I would not want, let's say, 7 by 50 binoculars because a 50 millimeter aperture divided by 7 for the exit pupil, well, 50 divided by 7 is about 7.1. I'm never going to be able to take, it, take advantage of that. That's number one. Number two, the reason I don't want those binoculars is that if I can't take in the full cone of light coming out of the binocular, in other words, take full advantage of the exit pupil, not only is it gathering more starlight, but the larger aperture of those binoculars are also gathering more light pollution and sky glow and contrast is going to suffer. And that's an important thing because so many objects, including many of them on the, on the uh, challenge list this year, are low contrast. And therefore, they take some effort to see them. And 7 by 50 would not. Whereas, let's say, 10 by 50 binoculars, even though they're still 50 millimeters in aperture, the 10 power, the five millimeter exit pupil could increase the contrast enough. All of a sudden I say, oh, wait a minute, there it is. Whereas with the seven by fifties, I would have missed it. Okay. So that's an important distinction to make. Okay. Another question that I always try to ask people is, so how are you going to hold them? You know, as it says, steady as she goes. Are you going to support them by hand? Well, here's my daughter, Helen, holding a pair of uh, 16 by 70 Fujinons, which I would not ever recommend just viewing by hand. But I, I had her pose for me here because it shows the technique that I always recommend, regardless of the size. You want to, most people, when they hold binoculars by hand, they often will grip around the, the uh, prism housing, the prism end, which is directly adjacent to the, to the eyepieces. Okay, they're going to grab, if you can see my cursor, grab toward this end. Well, the objective lenses, they weigh something. And so they're going to be cantilevered out in front of your support point. And you cantilever that much weight out in front of you, all of a sudden you end up with essentially as a diving board effect. You have a great moment arm that's going to cause much more wobble. Whereas if you grab them as she is, one hand, thumb and forefinger, cupping the two objective lenses, and the other end, the eyepiece, is pretty much you know, sitting against the, the bridge of your nose and your cheekbones. That's going to be much steadier, a much better way of holding them. I don't care what size binocular you're talking about. That's, a, in my opinion, the better way to hold them. But if you're going to support the binoculars by hand alone, my recommendation is I wouldn't go greater than 10, mil, uh, 10 uh, power for magnification. Maximum magnification I'd do is 10. And 50 millimeter would be the maximum objectives. Now, when I tell people this, I'll often get replies say, well, you know, I've been able to hold 15 by 70 binoculars or I've been able to hold, you know, larger than 10 by 50s. My response to that is fine. For how long? See, they weigh something. And eventually, especially because if you're tilted up, even if you're sitting in a chair, you're tilted up, 
it's going to really get your arms tired. So therefore, again, my recommendation, just me talking, I would go with 10 by 50s. See, I don't believe that unless you, again, live under perfectly dark skies all the time, you're always going to use the binoculars under perfectly dark skies, and you're always going to be 18 years old, then I'd say, okay, 7 by 50s. Okay, But if you only observe once in a while under really dark skies, and you realize you're not going to be 18 forever, then you probably want to go to a more toward a five millimeter exit pupil. And that, again, that would be my, my recommendation. And I use 10 by 50 predominantly, and you know they're wonderful. But what if you want more power? As Captain Kirk often, uh, often was heard to utter on the USS Enterprise, what do you do? We need more power, Scotty. Well, one option would be image-stabilized binoculars, because if you take a look at them, either by Fujinon, by Canon, or by Zeiss, uh, going from, from top left around counterclockwise, you're going to see, with the exception of Zeiss, Zeiss is a huge okay, and comparatively heavy. But the Fujinons and the Canons, uh, they're usually pretty small objective lenses, okay, 30 millimeter upwards to about 50 millimeter, I think is the top. Once they introduce another model, it's bigger, but I think it's it goes up to about uh, 50 millimeter or so. And so that the glass is relatively lightweight, which is good because everything you have inside, the image stabilization uh, has a, a weight factor to figure into it also. Well, that's a great way, image stabilized binoculars, to take away the jitters. So it will allow you to hold binoculars that have a greater magnification. Again, the objective lens is going to be smaller but the magnification may be higher, like 15 by 50 binoculars, for instance, in the Canon collection is, is a popular option, okay? And that's fine. I mean, they're going to cost big bucks, you know, make no mistake. The image quality is outstanding, outstanding. But again, if you're still going to hand hold them, that's a challenge simply because they have a weight. And you're going to get tired, in my opinion. You're going to get tired after a while. That's why I rarely, rarely support, I don't have image stabilized binoculars, to be clear. But even if I did, I would still put them on a tripod or some other support. Because again, if I'm looking up and I'm looking up for a, for a length of time, my arms can't take it. And so I know that I'm going to become, you know, jittery, number one, and eventually just say, well, okay, I got I to gotta rest and put them, put them down. So again, how do we support binoculars? Most people say, well, I'll put them on a tripod or maybe a monopod, okay, which is great. Tripods are monopods. But that means you need an L adapter or an L bracket, like you see on the, I have four samples over there on the on the right-hand side, which is great. They're designed specifically, as long as your binocular has a tripod mount, a threaded insert, typically in the hinge assembly between the two barrels, like you see mine here uh, shows on the left-hand side, then you use one of these L brackets onto your tripod and they're married together. Unfortunately, most tripods are not designed for binocular use, at least not looking up at the sky. Most tripods are designed to hold cameras that are going to be aimed more or less horizontally, at least most of the time, and more or less horizontally. Trying to get under your typical camera tripod can be a challenge, especially for somebody like me who's six, six feet four. So I look like this, or I might look like that. And that's not really the way you want to go about it. Okay, there are better solutions than your your typical low end tripod that you might be able to pick up for fifty, seventy five, a hundred dollars. Let's say over at Walmart. Not to pick on them, but I'm just saying in general, uh, Amazon. You know, some of the the more general consumer uh, outlets, the the tripods may not really serve the purpose you're looking for. And so one option is a monopod, which I think is a, a great solution shown here. You'll notice though the monopod has an intermediate connection between the binoculars and the, the monopod itself. In this case, it's a uh, trigger grip that you see sold separately typically. The idea is you grab the trigger that you can see on the right-hand side, and you can twist the binoculars up and around to whatever angle you want, then you let go of it, and they lock in place. And although admittedly you have to hand hold the monopod, it's going to be much easier to do that than it is to actually hold the binoculars independently. So that's one option, certainly. Another option is come up with your own. This is kind of a neat thing that I found online. Uh, it's it's you'll notice the same uh, the same trigger grip in between the binocular and what he made up. But the thing I liked about this was he took a monopod, but then he cobbled together this contraption where he has a couple of horizontal beams going across. 
And so he actually supports it now with not one hand holding a monopod, but rather the two elbows support it. That's kind of a neat trick. And I can see that would work even if you're sitting. You could probably lower the monopod enough so you can actually be seated and use it. So I thought that was kind of a, a, a neat take on a uh, uh, on another pro. But he, again, he made inside. It's kind of kind of complicated to explain. Inside, he has some pieces of Teflon and the two uh, screws that you see sticking out uh, with the wing nuts. Uh, there's a braking system or you know a clutch mechanism of a sort that the the wooden plates um, pull together. This this are pulled together, and so that varies the the amount of pressure and tension that you have to make the binoculars either easier to move or harder to move, and you can move them back and forth. And Anyway, I thought that was kind of a, a neat approach to the situation, to the angle. My tripod that I use is made by Manfrotto. Specifically, it's the 475B tripod, if anybody really cares. The nice thing about this, and I bought it back in 1990 for the total solar eclipse of July 91 that I saw from down in Mexico. It packs up pretty, pretty nicely. But the beauty is not only does it have a very high weight capacity, uh, weight carrying capacity, but it also can extend over six feet tall with the elevator fully up. And so I could put my my 25 by 100 uh, zoom L binoculars that you see on the right here. I could put them on top of that. And except for the very zenith, I can have a pretty good view because I can actually get under the eyepieces. Now, some people are going to say, well, why don't you have an intermediate um, such as a, a parallelogram type binocular mount. We'll take a look at them in a slide or two. Uh, I have in the past, but I found that I haven't really tried the, the the Orion Monster one yet, but everybody else that I've tried at least, they couldn't hold the weight of these binoculars. They were just too heavy. And so I find that instead of cantilever, cantilevering the weight out a distance away from the, the center line of the tripod, I just sort of make the best of it and go from there. You know, is there a more elegant solution? Yeah, absolutely. And I should really invest in a little more thought behind it. But that's the, the approach I take today. I use a video head because it's smoother. I don't have to keep locking and unlocking the axes. I can just pretty much move it up and down by adjusting the tension. And it allows me to, to like I say, pretty much up to the zenith and still be able to get under the eyepieces. At the zenith and maybe within maybe five or so degrees of the zenith can be kind of tough. But other than that, they seem to be a pretty good combination for me at least. Flexible parallelogram mounts have been around for, she was 30 plus years now, uh, ever since Steve Kufeld came up with the first one. Actually, that was, that's back in the 80s. And Steve Kufeld, you may know that name as uh, the inventor of the Telrad. Also, Lee came up with this as well, the late, the late Steve Kufeld, unfortunately. He came up with this design also. There have been many takes on it since. Some are commercially available. As you can buy, I mentioned the Orion Monster Parallelogram is just one example. Uh, you can purchase them uh, commercially. Or you can make them on your own. Certainly, there are plenty of designs online. If you just Google parallelogram binocular mount, you're going to have websites falling out of the sky with all possibilities. If you want to get a little bit fancier still, I love these chair chair based systems. On the left hand side, a little more basic. We have the binoculars on a platform. We have two arms extending on either side of this zero gravity chair, as it's called, with a couple of bungee cords here to act as the um, um, tension, if you will, and it's balanced and so forth and so on. And that's kind of a neat way to go about it. I love the star rocker on the right-hand side also. Uh, there, it's almost like a Dobsonian mount, and you're sitting inside the mount as it's going up and down in altitude. And then your leg power, you're sitting in both cases on essentially a lazy Susan. Uh, leg power, feet power, you can move back and forth, you know, left to right as you uh, pull the binoculars up and down. So again, very, very neat ideas. And all kinds of other ideas online as well. Well, necessity is the mother of invention. This is an interesting, very simple design. You sit in a chair and you use another chair folded up to simply hold the binoculars. Again, it's it's really open to your imagination what you can come up with. Uh, this particular design may be a, somewhat limited, but you probably have a second chair, a second folding chair right now. So maybe it's worth investigating something as simple as, as this. The thing I like about mounting binoculars on something, I mentioned before, I always do, if I'm using my 10 by 50s, if I'm using my 25 by 100s or anything in between, um, I like to do that because when I go viewing, and I would recommend this for the observing challenge, although it's not an absolute must, um, 
it's a good idea to mount them because if you're going to be doing star hopping, as you would, let's say, with a telescope, you know that you're going to go between your star chart and the eyepiece of the telescope, and you're going to be going back and forth and back and forth. Same with the binoculars. You're going to go back and forth between the chart and your binoculars. Well, if you're holding it by hand or supporting it like this even, you have to put the binoculars down to look at the chart. Well, then you have to start defining uh, process all over again. So you have to first discover where you left off, and then you have to take the next step over to the, the target. And that's going to be a pain in the neck. So I think mounting binoculars, especially for something like an observer's challenge like we're looking at here, I, I think is is almost a prerequisite. I mean, some of the objects admittedly are, are very simple to find. Others might be a little more involved. And those are the ones I'm talking about. You need a decent chart and you need a way to hold a binocular steady while you're using that chart to, uh, to go from point A, B, C, and, and so forth to the target. Another question I often will get from people using larger binoculars, which is why, again, I always recommend something like a 10 power binocular, because not only is it lighter, 10 by 50 is lighter to hold, but it also has a wider field of view. And so it's easier to find your way around. Whereas with my 25 by 100s, there the field of view is a little over two degrees to two point something. And trying to aim them can be a bit of a bit of a task. So what do we do in a case like that? Well, you can you can attach a unity finder, red dot finder, if you prefer, onto binoculars by a couple of different commercial mounts, or you could certainly dream up your own, um, I suppose. But this one from Oberwork, it'll attach on the central bar, and I should get this for my, my 25s. It'll attach to the central bar of the binocular like this, and then you can simply slide on your unity finder, your red dot finder, on there. It's large enough or high enough, I should say, the shoe, if that's what you want to call it, the mounting shoe, is high enough to get over that central knob. So it, it doesn't, it looks awfully close, but it actually doesn't interfere. The view does not interfere. So that's from Oberwork. Another possibility from Astronomy Shop is the Bino Bracket U2. You see that it also clamps onto the central beam, if you will, but it's a little bit higher, which is not a bad idea. Okay, you get a little bit above the binocular, so that's not a... Uh, not a bad thing at all, because if it's low, you could actually breathe on it and then fog the window. Or something like this. This is on Amazon, actually. And I, I've heard of some people using it. I'm not familiar with it because I just discovered it the other day. But it can also clamp onto that central beam. And then you can thread on some sort of a finder. It's a, a quarter 20 uh, stud sticking out there. So you could thread on something. Well, most of the red dot finders have a slide on type bracket, they don't thread on. So you'd have to come up with some sort of an intermediate um, manner of holding the one to the other. But that is a possibility as well. So what's up? What do we look at tonight? Let's take a look at the challenge that we dreamt up here. There are 20 objects. Here are the rules. The 20 of, of the 20, uh, you're going to see 15 to be recognized as having beat the challenge. Okay, like I said, there are 20 all together. I order them. Um, according to right ascension. So you see the first is M13, all the way down to NGC 869 slash 884, better known as the double cluster. And that's at right ascension uh, two hours. And so you're gonna have to wait a little bit later in the evening, of course, to pick that up, although it is more or less, well, it's not circumpolar exactly, but it's, it's close enough. They should be up in the sky uh, relatively early. So what I'd like to do is just take the, a few minutes to review the, the ones that we have here for this year, beginning with, of course, M13. Uh, M13, it's not quite magnitude 6, a little bit brighter. It's about magnitude 5.8, so therefore it really is visible with the naked eye. And as a matter of fact, to tell you where I am with light pollution, where I live on Long Island, when we first moved into this house 19 years ago, I was able to see M13 naked eye if I looked at it when it was pretty much overhead, or at least as high in the sky as it was going to get. I could actually see a naked eye, not even close uh, anymore, Okay, not even close. I've lost at least a full magnitude. Uh, where I live, at least a full magnitude, it's simply because of of light pollution. It's still the way of the world, unfortunately. Uh, M13 is about twenty two thousand, a little over twenty two thousand light years away. Um, but uh, uh, to sort of put that into comparison, compared to the stars in, in the neighborhood of our sun, the stars in M13 uh, more than one hundred times more densely packed. Of course, this photograph taken by Astrophoto Andy was the credit shows resolution, which in binoculars, unfortunately, you're really not going to be able to see. It's going to look like a pretty much a little bit of a celestial cotton ball, so to speak, un, unresolved. Uh, but still, a beautiful object with 
two stars standing to either side of it, I refer to them sort of as sentry stars, uh, make it easy to find. So that's our first, our first challenge. Continuing with the theme of globular clusters, M10 and M12 are almost identical globulars within almost the same field of view. M10 was discovered by uh, Charles Messier himself on May 29th, 1764, and M12 was discovered, again by Messier, just one night later. So that was a pretty good run uh, that he was having. Uh, of the two, M10, it, which is um, the one on the, the right, in the, I'm sorry, the left on, in this picture, uh, M10 is a little bit brighter, only a tenth of a magnitude difference, as a matter of fact, uh, but they, they look almost twin through binoculars. Like I say, you may not be able to squeeze them into the same field of view, but it's simply, they do, the field of fields of view will overlap, so you can just go back and forth and compare the two directly, which is kind of fun to do. You're going to find that uh, M10, like I say, is a little bit brighter, although quite honestly, with a casual glance, you won't be able to pick up the difference one way or the other. Uh, M10 is a little bit closer, a little over 14,000 light years away, whereas M12 is a little over 16,000 light years away. So even though they look like they're neighbors, they really aren't. Although they must have a great view of each other with only a couple of thousand light years in between the two. I mean, that sounds far away, but uh, still they must have a pretty good view of each other. So that's in central Ophiuchus. The next, sticking with, again, I like globular clusters, is uh, we have M62, also discovered by Messier, 1771, for this, so seven years after M10 and 12. It's about the same brain. It's actually just a smidge brighter than M10. M10 has a listed magnitude of 6.6. Of this one's 6.5, so it's pretty close. It is farther away, though. It's about 50% farther away than M10. M10 is about 14,000 light years. This one is somewhere on the order of 21 and a half thousand light years away. A bit of a challenge to find this one, quite honestly, which is why you need a pretty good chart. All the charts that you see accompanying the slides here, I created using my own Turn the Universe Through Binoculars Atlas uh, software, which is free. You can download it to my website. I'll talk, if, I'll talk about that at the very end. It was designed originally to accompany the book, Turn the Universe Through Binoculars, that Dan very kindly mentioned in the intro uh, here uh, by a buddy of mine. Uh, Dean um, um, Williams, in he lives outside of, of uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and he came up with this. He, he dumped in the database of the more than 1,000, more than 1,100 objects I actually list in the book, and he created these, these charts, which are wonderful. Originally designed to work with Windows 98. Yikes, remember that. Uh, but they even work with Windows 10. So I'm not too sure about Windows 11. I would suspect they would. You may have to run them in run the program in compatibility mode, um, it was it was last compatible with uh, XP, so you just run in compatibility mode, and it'll install just fine. But uh, but that's what I've used for all these all these charts. You can see M62. If you notice my my cursor over here, here is M62 just over the line in um, serpents, just over the line. But it's easiest to find it starting at Antares, which you'll see toward the the right hand side of the chart over here, and sort of going diagonally down across. At least that's the way I do it. And um, it, uh, it shows up rather nicely in binoculars. On to the next, M16, the Eagle Nebula. Well, we've all seen the photographs of the Eagle Nebula taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. With the pillars of creation, it, it's, it's maybe the single most famous photograph ever taken with Hubble. Really, really struck the imagination. Well, you're not going to see the pillars of creation in binoculars. As a matter of fact, you probably wouldn't even see the nebula itself. Instead, you're going to see the star cluster that's associated with it. Okay, and that's what we're looking at in this in this uh, sketch made by Steve Con Tonkin, who's a, a very famous. He's he is Mr. Binoculars, um, certainly over in the UK. There, in fact, his website binocularsky.com has all kinds of great information. So I really would recommend you write that down and visit his website. A terrific resource. But in any case, here's a sketch that he made of M16. And as you can see in the very center of the of the field, you see stars. Now, you will see some indication of nebulosity under really dark skies, but you have to have a larger aperture. For instance, I can see hints of the nebulosity in my 25 by 100s from up at Stellafane, not even remotely close with my 10 by 50s if I'm the same location. Okay. So the nebulosity itself is very, very faint. Nebulosity, of course, is a, a hydrogen-2 ionized, ionized hydrogen region, which shines predominantly in the, at the red end of the spectrum, and our eyes are pretty much colorblind to the red 
dim red light. So therefore, we see the stars. Okay. Uh, in fact, it contains the nebula. I mean, contains several active star-forming regions, and that's what we're looking at here. It's large, though. The nebula uh, spans uh, close to a degree in diameter. In fact, a smidge over a degree. It shines at about magnitude 6.4, but that's pr primarily uh, a reflection of the brightness of the stars as opposed to the nebulosity itself. Next up, we have M11, the wild duck cluster. Try as I might with the wild duck cluster, it doesn't matter if it's binoculars, a telescope, or whatever, I'm not seeing any ducks. I mean, I know they say it looks like a flock of ducks and so I'm sorry. You know, my, my head, I just don't, I don't see ducks. <laughs> sorry. Just doesn't. Don't have the imagination, I guess. But uh, I do, of course, see what looks almost to me looks like a comet, okay, in binoculars with a very bright nuclear core. Well, that's because the brightest star in M11 shies, shines at about eighth magnitude, whereas the other stars, and there are close to 900 stars in M11, they actually shine, well, they go down to about magnitude six, 16 and a half. So we don't see individual stars through binoculars except for that one eighth magnitude point. Instead, we see sort of their collective glow. And because eighth magnitude uh, star is off to one side, again, it gives me, at least in my mind, the impression of almost like a comet. At least that's the, the view I get. It also shines a little bit brighter than uh, sixth magnitude, magnitude 5.8. And so it could be visible naked eye if you have a really good sense of... Uh, um, perception it might easy enough to find you find the tail feathers of aquila the eagle and you have three stars they make sort of an arc and you just sort of follow the arc and a bang goes right into m11 so use the stars at the tails of aquila the eagle to find m11 uh, which is in scutum uh, the shield it's about the if not the it's certainly one of the richest open star clusters known one of the most compact also Next up, we have the Ring Nebula, M57. Do you see that picture? That's pretty close to how it looks in binoculars. The M57, being a planetary nebula, is really tiny in binoculars. Binoculars have a lot of strengths, but one of their strengths is not seeing planetary nebulas. Okay, they're very small, and so therefore their disks at low magnification appear as points of light, or very nearly points of light. But the good thing about M57 is it's right along the base of Lyra, the harp. And so you can see the two stars at the base of the, the um, parallelogram that makes up the body of, of the harp or the lyre. And you'll see that M57 is right over here, not quite halfway in between the two. Now, admittedly, there are a lot of stars that are similar in brightness in that same general neck of the woods. And so trying to figure out which exactly is, is M57, which is just a random field star, takes a pretty decent finder chart uh, to do that. So it's easy to find, but sometimes easy easy to locate, I should say, but sometimes it's, it's tough to find. Okay? But that's the challenge. Okay? Uh, and it's, it's fun to do. It was discovered by Charles Messier in January 1779. It was independently found a few years later by a French astronomer, and I'm looking at his name here. I'm going to mispronounce it terribly because I, I do not speak French. I have enough trouble with English. It's uh, Antoine uh, Darque de... Pelopoi. <laughs> kind of terrible. Um, he, the reason I mentioned him is he described it as, as large as Jupiter and resembling a planet which is faded. And that was really the first time that the term planet was associated with this type of an object. Now, it's often thought that maybe William Herschel was the one who came up with the phrase planetary nebula because he did, he did use that. However, this predates Herschel. And so you have to wonder if maybe the planetary nebula didn't wasn't at least first uh, uttered because of, of this this observation. M57 is close to ninth magnitude, tough to find. Again, you need a good finder chart to, to make it out. There it is right there. Next up, we have the coat hanger, Colinder 399, one of the most favorite asterisms of the summertime sky. It is an asterism, even though it's also referred to as uh, Brachy's cluster. It's not a cluster at all, despite appearances. Uh, we have stars going across. Can you see the coat hanger? It's upside down, admittedly, but there's my coat hanger, right like so. Uh, the stars uh, range in brightness from oh, somewhere around sixth magnitude to about eighth magnitude or thereabouts, or something like that. But again, it's not a true cluster. Uh, that was actually proved 
uh, thanks to the Hipparcos uh, satellite, astrometric uh, satellite back in 1997, actually. The stars themselves lie at varying distances, anywhere from as close as 237 light years away up to over 2,200 light years away. I mentioned it's also sometimes referred to as Brachy's cluster, at least in older um, sources. You'll see Brachy's cluster um, because that was actually an amateur astronomer, uh, Domero Bracci, who used to create charts for the AAVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And he created a chart of this pattern uh, for use with calibrating photometers at the time because that's such a wide range of brightness. I thought it was a, a pretty, good, pretty good choice. Uh, unfortunately, again, the nickname Bracci's cluster used to be repeated. It's kind of been dropped to history now, and so it's just referred to as the coat hanger. But again, not a cluster, just an asterism. I love asterisms. Asterisms are fun to look for. Just random, randomly scattered stars that collectively in the human brain, we always try to make shapes out of things. I don't care if it's clouds up in the sky or patterns of stars that we see at night. We try to make terrestrial shapes out of things. And so asterism hunting is, is a, a sport unto itself. And binoculars are great for it. But the coat hanger is, is a perfect example of an asterism. Next up, we have Alberio or Beta Cygni, if you will. It's about 420 light years away. Beautiful in, uh, beautiful in telescopes. A challenge in 10 power, okay, because they're about 34 arc, uh, 34 arc seconds apart. Alberio A, which is yellow. Alberio B, which is the blue star. About 34 arc seconds apart, which is about at the resolution of 10 by 50 binoculars. Just about. Okay, And so, therefore, that's why it's a challenge. Now, there's always been a lot of debate back and forth. Is Alberio an actual physical binary star system, or are they just two randomly aligned stars? Because the position angle, that is the position of, of the blue star, Alberio B, with respect to Alberio A, the yellow star, really hasn't changed for hundreds of years. Hundreds and hundreds of years. It really hasn't changed. And so it's thought that if it is an actual physical binary system, their orbital period must be at least 100,000 light years. 100,000 years, I'm sorry, afford to complete one orbit. That is the blue star around the yellow star. About 100,000 light years. Studies, unfortunately, don't really help, even if we talk about the Gaia mission or the Hipparcos astrometric missions before. Uh, Alberio A projected distance of about 430 uh, light years away, whereas B is about 400 light years away. 30 light years apart. Is that close enough to have a physical gravitational connection? Probably not. But there's enough variation in that data that if one's a little bit closer and one's a little bit farther away, maybe they are physically associated with each other. So the jury is still out on that. But a beautiful view in binoculars, regardless, and a challenge with 10 power, better to support okay, to looking at, for looking at Alberio because of the shuddering, shaking, um, may make it difficult to resolve the two. M71, a globular cluster for a long time, it was thought to be an open star cluster. Okay, a very densely packed open cluster like, like M11 is. But it turns out later studies, back in the 70s actually, proved that it, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it was a, um, a globular cluster because of the stars, the, the spectra and the composition, the metallicity and so forth of the stars uh, proved to be older stars. And so therefore it was a globular. Uh, it's about 13,000 light years away, eighth magnitude. Can be a little bit difficult to, to discover, to find. But if you find Sagitta, the arrow, which is a great um, constellation, despite the fact that the stars are fairly faint, they do stand out reasonably well, uh, just north of Alberio, uh, of uh, Altair, rather, I'm sorry, uh, north of Altair, uh, you'll find it. Binoculars may help to find the constellation, but uh, you'll see it in my chart over here. There's the coat hanger for reference, and you'll see M71 directly adjacent to it. Next up, we have the Dumbbell Nebula, the first planetary nebula to discover to be discovered. Charles Messier bumped into it back in 1764. It's about 1,300 and not quite 1,400 light years away. Seventh magnitude, so it's nice and bright, and it's about eight minutes by about six minutes in apparent size. And so, therefore, it's actually large enough to be seen in more than just a star through binoculars. It's ideal for binoculars, uh, the Dumbbell Nebula is. So again, by all means, take a look. Now, the trick here again is to locate it. Well, how do you look at it? People use different ways of approaching the Dumbbell Nebula. Some like to cite it off of, uh, off of um, Beta Cygni or Alberio. 
And if you look at my chart, you can see that. Here is Beta Cygni, and follow the line of stars down just like so, and you bump right into M27, the dumbbell, just like that. My way of doing it, though, I first find, after I'm done looking at M71, I find Sagitta again. I find this star that the pointy end of the triangle in Sagitta is, is aimed toward. I find this star, and then I go about a binocular field up, maybe not quite, and I see M27 right next to a reasonably bright field star. Either way, though, you'll know, as soon as you see it, you'll know it. So it's a bit of a challenge to find, but once you do find it, it's unmistakable. Next, we have NCC 7000, the North America Nebula. Um, that was discovered uh, not by not by Messier, of course, it's not the Messier catalog, but rather by William Herschel back in 1786. He noted just simply a, a faint milky nebulosity. Okay, uh, in some places pretty bright, but he didn't really describe it much beyond that. Really, it was um, the American astronomer Stuart Sharpless using Palomar Sky Survey plates in 1959, realized that he didn't name the North American Nebula per se, but he did realize that it wasn't a standalone object. He realized actually it was part of a much larger complex of nebulosity. He pointed out, for instance, that the east coast of North America, so here we have the east coast like so, coming down to Florida, curving around to the Gulf of Mexico, and then down toward mainland Mexico and, and like. He noted that the east coast of North America, this North America, is separated by the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> with another fainter patch of nebulosity merely to its, as we're looking at here, to its right or to its west. He realized that they were both the same nebula, just divided by a dark nebula in between the two. Uh, again, the first person to realize that. Now, the portion to the right of the dark nebulosity is also nicknamed the Pelican Nebula. Uh, I see uh, 5146, I believe it is. The North American Nebula, under good skies, you can see naked eye. Okay, I could from Stellavane just a couple of weeks ago, and eight, 19 years ago, I could also see from my backyard. When I could also see M13 naked eye. Not anymore, Okay, but I could, could back then. But yes, it still was naked eye of a cellophane uh, this year. So undoubtedly, from where we're all going to be in West Virginia, it will also be dark enough uh, and hopefully clear enough to see a naked eye as well. So in that sense, you don't even need binoculars to make it out. Uh, you can use binoculars, though, to better identify the shape and also to try your luck, even though it's not on my list, as a bonus object, try your luck with the Pelican Nebula. That's tough. Yeah, the Pelican Nebula is tough. But again, binoculars are ideal because of the size. Globular cluster M15 and Pegasus, uh, just a little bit to the northwest of Enif, or Epsilon Pegasi, the brightest star in the constellation of Pegasus. You're going to find that it's directly adjacent to a couple of field stars. Make a little triangle. So make sure you're looking at the, the right thing. But that's M15. It's roughly about 35,000 light years away. It's also about 12 and a half billion years old, which makes it one of the oldest known globular clusters. Next up, we have M39, discovered in 1749 by uh, Le Gentil. It's about fifth magnitude, also naked eye. The stars themselves, though, go down to, they're about ninth magnitude-ish, sorry, and more like eighth magnitude, most of them are. Uh, you'll see between one and two dozen as you aim your binoculars at, uh, its way. Mu Cephei, Herschel's Garnet Star. Now, that was on my list, quite honestly, this year at Stellafane. And I was very disappointed. It did not have a garnet color, at least in my eye. It was very pale. And so it will vary because it is a variable star, not by much. It goes from about magnitude 3.4 to 5.1 or so. But when it's dimmer, it will appear redder. And when it's brighter, it appears more washed out. So I honestly didn't make a magnitude estimate of it, but it might be toward the high side. I don't, I don't know that. But it, it struck me as being very pale by comparison this year. If you also have trouble seeing the colors, try defocusing your binocular very, very slightly. I mean, just a smidge off a of sharp focus. And sometimes you'll have better um, um, perception of, of uh, dim colors. You can try that also with the blue snowball, NGC 7662. Beautiful object in Andromeda, uh, the Blue Snowball Nebula, a planetary nebula discovered in 1784 by William Herschel. The nickname apparently came from an article written by Leyland Copeland in the February 1960 issue of Sky and Telescope. 
because he described it as a nebula looking like a light blue snowball. And you can even see the color in binoculars. It's about magnitude 8.6 or so. It's about 37 arc seconds. So you can't actually see a disk. At least I, I can in my, my uh, 16 by 70s. The 10 by 50s, eh, disk is a little bit, bit of a stretch. But it's only with the, the 16 by 70s I can. What do you see here? This is Eddie's coaster. This is a an asterism. Can you see it? Well, let me help you along. That's Eddie, who came out. Eddie Carpenter, the late Eddie Carpenter, unfortunately. Amateur astronomer in England. Uh, outstanding, outstanding visual observer. You could ride his coaster. We're in, we're in Cassiopeia right now. You see on the chart on the, on the right. You see Eddie's coaster. I highlighted over here. And follow along. Eddie's coaster is just that. It's a roller coaster of faint stars with two peaks and two dips. And the second dip really drops off over to the, the east or, or to the left as we're looking at it here. So it, it spans about three degrees. And so binoculars are perfect for it. Perfect. So it's a lot of fun. You ride the coaster from west to east. It starts at a seventh magnitude star, which is right about over where my, my cursor is pointing now. And then it slowly goes up and down and up and down once again uh, to the end. You also can have a creative eye if you look at NGC 457. Now, I call it the owl cluster because when I look there, I see an owl. Okay, Some people are referred to as the ET cluster. Some refer to it as the Kachina doll cluster. I've read dragonfly cluster, all kinds of different things. But again, it's a human eye's um, tendency to try to draw familiar shapes among just random points of, of stars, random stars. Uh, discovered by Herschel back in 1780, one of the objects, I have no idea how Messier mix, missed it, but he did. Um, now, the brightest two stars that make the eyes of my owl over here, the brighter of the two is Phi Cassiopeia. Um, whether or not that's an actual member of the cluster or not, that jury's a bit out too. If it is, then it would have to be one of the brightest stars known, surpassing even Rigel in luminosity. For comparison, if you're, uh, it's, it's thought to be the cluster, I mean, is thought to be about uh, not quite 8,000 light years away. If you were to put the sun there at the distance, 8,000 light years away, the sun would be just 17th magnitude to give you an idea for how bright these stars must be. Hey, Phil. Yes. We, oh, I'm I know you have a few slides, but we have gone past even the time we were supposed to cut off and we haven't done any questions. So I okay. wonder if you wanted to wrap up real quick. That we way, going, I have, had a few questions. Yep. I, I have, This slide is my last slide, as a matter of fact. So thank you. Um, we have the double cluster which you can see in this drawing over here. And then we have stock two, the muscle man cluster. I don't know if you can see the muscle man cluster right over here, stock two. Let me help you out a little bit. There he is. That was the brainchild of John Davis. Uh, the late John Davis, good friend of mine from Amherst, Massachusetts. He came up with this description. And uh, it does look like a muscle man. The stars are faint in 10 by 50s, but um, still they, uh, they do stand out. So take a look at the muscle man and... Um, uh, when you next look at the at the uh, double cluster, that's pretty much about it. As I say, the charts that I created, um, I did so with the Turing Universe through binoculars atlas or tuba, I call it for short. Go to my website, philharrington.net, and you'll see it there. You can download it and uh, guaranteed virus free. Okay, and uh, you create charts also. That's pretty much about it. Um, you can also contact me through my website as well if you have any questions about this afterwards. Again, I'd love to hear from people. And uh, let me know what you think. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions now in the couple of seconds we have left. Great job, Phil. Thank you. Anybody? Questions? Yeah, excellent job. And, and Phil, I know you mentioned uh, so a bunch of uh, links and reference material. I'd be happy to get those links from you and post them yep. um, in the description on the video sure. that we post. And um, um, I don't see any questions in chat, so let's just wait just for another second and then we'll give a break. And thanks again, Phil. We really appreciate it and look forward to having you at HSP next year. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you and uh, really look forward to looking at a number of those objects. Good, good, good luck with them. Thank you. I'm definitely gonna look into that trigger, Phil. I've never seen one of those before. Um, the monopod yeah, trigger. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. neat. Interesting approach. Yeah. Interesting yep. approach.